So I've mentioned this problem in many of my videos. It is one of the most famous quantum mechanics problems, and it is definitely one of the most important. And it is solving the Schrodinger equation for the one-dimensional quantum harmonic oscillator using the operator method. Not only is it an interesting problem because it's an exactly solvable one and it ends up yielding an isospectral system, but it's really interesting and important given the nature of the math structure that arises when you do solve it with the operator method. In fact, it's precisely the raising and lowering operator nature of the math structure that results when you do it this way that has resulted in it being so relevant and so important, or at least it's one of the reasons. And it's certainly the reason why I've mentioned it in other videos. So here follows the math portion where I show you the actual details of doing this problem with the operator method. We can obtain the Schrodinger equation for the quantum harmonic oscillator by simply selecting the harmonic oscillator potential for the potential we insert into the Hamiltonian. If we remember that omega is square root of the spring constant over m, then this particular selection makes perfect sense. It really is just a half kx squared. Now we're going to take the operator method, the latter operator method, to solving this problem. Basically, what that means is we can break apart the Hamiltonian into two factors, two differential operator factors that are Hermitian conjugates of each other. And it turns out these particular operators have amazing properties, properties that will allow us to, through rather wonderful cleverness, solve out this problem, not only completely, but also in a way that reveals some very nice intuition. If we look back at this Hamiltonian, we find that it can, in fact, be factored like this, which allows us to identify these two operators and re-express the Schrodinger equation like this. As I said, it turns out that the entire problem can be solved just by studying the properties of A and A dagger in detail. In this effort, the first useful thing is to evaluate the commutator, and then construct this operator, which is called the number operator. Using this commutation relation we just worked out, we can use the definition of the number operator to work out these two commutation relations. The next step in solving the harmonic oscillator problem is to study the number operator's eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Let's start by postulating the existence of a number operator eigenstate called a number state. If we take this number state and act on it with the commutators that we've evaluated up here involving the A operators and N, we find the following effect that the A operators have on the number state and this effect from their Hermitian conjugates. So we see that the effect of this A operator is to lower the number operator eigenvalue by one, and the Hermitian conjugate has the opposite effect. It raises it by one. Then if we recognize that we can write the Hamiltonian in terms of the number operator like this, we see that it actually increases and decreases the energy eigenvalue by h bar omega. Because when you apply this Hamiltonian to a number state, the number operator acts on it to give an eigenvalue that is increased by one or decreased by one, depending on whether you're using a dagger or a respectively. So then the coefficient on the h bar omega is increased or decreased by one. So really what we've seen is that these operators change the quantum state of the system, up one or down one unit of h bar omega. If we next consider that the expectation value of the number operator must be non-negative, you can see that from here, and that, that implies the same result for the Hamiltonian given the relationship between the number operator and the Hamiltonian, we then see that this must mean that there's a lower state that gets zeroed by the lowering operator. We see also that in addition to this, in order for this to never go below zero, all allowed states must necessarily have integer number operator eigenvalues. Otherwise, you could start with that state that did not have an integer number operator eigenvalue and lower it down to a state that was below zero because it would skip over the state that is zeroed by the lowering operator. So we see that if we figure out a way to construct sensible normalized states by just applying the raising operator to the vacuum, we necessarily cover every allowed state of the system.
Of course, doing that with the raising operators requires us to sort out a nuance of the normalization that will be talked about shortly. Now that we've identified the existence of such a state, we can apply the Hamiltonian to it to measure its energy. So we found that the lowest possible state, the one that's annihilated by the lowering operator, actually has a non-zero energy of h bar omega, a quantum zero point energy, because the raising operator increases the number eigenvalue by one, and its eigenvalue when applied to the ground state is zero, we see that the number eigenvalues must just be integers, counting the number of energy quanta the state contains. It is therefore customary to replace lambda with n, where n is taken to be an integer. Another interesting example that doesn't get to a state where the normalization problem first manifests is to look at the first excited state. We can define the first excited state like this and apply the Hamiltonian to it and we get 3 halves h bar omega as the energy eigenvalue. The eigenvalues of the number operator being integers also means that the energy is quantized and all neighboring energy levels are equidistant. Specifically they're separated by a difference of h bar omega. This is why the quantum harmonic oscillator is called an isospectral oscillator. We see trivially that the energy eigenvalue of an arbitrary number state is given by this formula. One may try constructing higher excited states by repeatedly acting on the ground state with the raising operator. This is the correct general idea, but it doesn't quite work as one might expect. There is a nuance with normalization that must be sorted out first. If we use our existing raising and lowering operators to transition between higher excited states, then the resulting states will not be normalized to unity. Working with unity normalization is not only standard, but it's a lot easier. We therefore must normalize our raising and lowering operators before using them to build and transition between higher excited states. So if we start by insisting that everything is normalized to unity, so these three equalities, and then we start by trying to define states like this. And then we find an inconsistency. If we actually directly calculate these out, we find that they don't equal 1. So what we can do, what we have to do, is normalize. We must normalize our operators to correct for this. Specifically, seeing these values, we immediately conclude that normalizing with these factors in the case of the raising operator and the lowering operator respectively, to get these normalized ones we end up with unity normalized states. Finally, enough operator formalism is sorted out now to begin the actual solving of the equation for the eigenfunctions. We figured out the eigenvalues, now we can figure out the eigenfunctions. One elects not to solve the full equation, but to solve the equation given by the annihilation operator applied to the ground state and then to apply the creation operator to that to get the excited states, specifically normalized properly. In position space, this relation, A acting on the vacuum, becomes this differential equation. We can rearrange that equation and then integrate it to get this solution here. Then if we pick this A0 constant to have this value, we find it's normalized. So this is the normalized ground state solution then repeatedly acting on this with that normalized raising operator in position space, we arrive at this final result. Specifically what happens is repeatedly differentiating this factor yields the same Gaussian times polynomials. And those polynomials end up just being the Hermite polynomials, specifically with this argument. So then this is the complete solution to the Schrodinger equation for the quantum harmonic oscillator derived via the operator method along with the associated eigenvalues. So now you've seen how to solve the Schrodinger equation for the one-dimensional quantum harmonic oscillator using the operator method. This is one of those problems where not just the starting equation and the solution are really, really beautiful. Also the solving method is. A lot of times you just solve it out and it's not particularly beautiful but the result is amazing and the equation, the Schrodinger equation, is obviously amazing. But in this particular case, the solving procedure itself gives such an amazingly beautiful mathematical structure in the process that it really is the case that the solving procedure in between the starting equation and the final solution is as beautiful as the original equation and the final solution. It's really a unique problem. It's a very special one and one you should definitely know about. 
I hope this helped you understand this bit of quantum mechanics a little bit better. I hope this video helped you love quantum mechanics even more. If it did help you, please give it a thumbs up, and don't forget to subscribe. Dietrich out.